ready to begin session one. Session one is entitled, What is Addiction? Well, we hit the streets to ask Christians this question. Watch these interviews and discover how much disagreement and confusion there is about what addiction is, even among Christians. What is addiction? When something has control over you so that your desire to keep doing it is greater than your desire to stop. What is addiction? I would say anything that you can't let go of, no matter how much you hate it. Addiction is something that is habit forming that is greater than yourself that you um, need help to, to be able to control. What is addiction? Anything that controls you and runs your behavior. What is addiction? Uh, anything that will take you out of your self. Uh, any relationship or substance um, that will take you out of your relationship with the Lord and God. What is addiction? Addiction is the inability to let go of um, uh, something that may be overtaking you. Addiction can be good and addiction can be bad. I think addiction, addiction is when your body involuntarily yearns for something, I mean, whatever that may be. So it could be good or bad, I guess, but, uh, but it's something that you, you need help to control. So you have to seek from somebody else, maybe be God or from, from whatever else to help you get, get a control of that addiction that you have, whatever your body's yearning for. Addiction is when you're in bondage to something and no matter how much you hate it, you can't get rid of it. It just, just keeps hanging on. Um, to me, addiction is when um, you're driven by something to, um, you could have, I guess, I guess, positive or negative addiction, but the negative part, and it's actually affecting our family right now, is um, when you will give up that, your walk with Christ to follow um, Satan's footsteps towards a, a destructive path. What is addiction? Uh, I would say addiction is a subconscious type of yearning or desire that you um, on the outside don't necessarily want to do but that you are um, drawn to uh, again subconsciously that is something that's like over time and, and, and usually uh, very hard to break. Wow that was amazing everybody had a different definition of what addiction is what should we make of that? What that means, Jamie, is that if we do not understand what addiction is, then we will not be able to help anyone who is addicted. A wise old sage said, everything is itself and not something else. In other words, addiction is not all of those definitions we heard. It is either one of them or none of them, but it cannot be all of them since in some way they all differed. Uh, they can't all be right. They can all be wrong but they cannot all be correct. But if you think that's disturbing, did you realize that even experts cannot agree on what addiction is? Take a look at these differing and in some cases conflicting definitions of addiction from various experts.
So the average Christian does not have a consistent definition of addiction and neither do the experts? That's correct. Again, everything is itself and not something else. So addiction is not anything other than what it is. The question, therefore, is what is addiction really? Uh, some of the definitions we've heard were medical, some were psychological, and some were sociological, or combinations of, of, of two or more of those. Uh, well, we have our own definition of addiction, and it is neither medical, psychological, nor sociological. It is biblical, and here it is. Addiction is a spiritual stronghold within which sin predominates. Now, it is spiritual because of sin. Sin is a spiritual phenomenon, not a medical, psychological, or sociological condition. It is a stronghold because it controls prepotently. In simple language, it's got you. It has a strong hold on you, and it has the capacity to enslave and control your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Every addictive behavior, if you think about it, is also sinful. Uh, whether it be drunkenness, uh, using illegal drugs, uh, overeating, pornography, adultery, gambling, all are sins in the Bible. So sin enslaves. Yes, habitual sin possesses an enslaving characteristic, and that's what people are dealing with, the effects of habitual sin. Uh, Jesus made an amazing statement in John 8, 34. He said, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Commits in this verse is what we call a present tense verb in Greek. You can think of it as a continuous tense verb. It carries the idea of a continual action. So Jesus is not talking about the occasional white lie. Uh, he's talking about sin that is committed repeatedly. In other words, you do that thing often enough, and sooner or later, it's got you. It could be gossip. Uh, it could be greed. It could be materialism, profanity, sarcasm, anger, abusive speech. Because of the nature of sin, and because its nature, in fact, is that it enslaves. If you do it often enough, it will ultimately become a dominating influence in your life. J.I. Packer said that a slave is a man who is not at his own disposal, but is his master's purchased property, uh, but to serve his master's needs, to be at his beck and call every moment. The slave's sole business is to do as he is told. Uh, Proverbs 5.22 says, his own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. Now, how does this work? Uh, people sometimes talk about addiction as bondage. Uh, some of our experts use that word. Technically speaking, a Christian is not in bondage to sin. Uh, we'll discuss this at length in our next session. But the New Testament does talk about bonds and bondage, and it does so in, in, in both a negative and positive sense. For example, in a negative sense, Acts 8.23 makes reference to the bondage of iniquity. Now, the Greek word for bondage is sundesmas. In a positive sense, Colossians 3.14 says, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The Greek word here for bond is, again, sundesmas. Sundesmas means to, to bring together, uh, to bind together, to unite. So you see, bondage is actually captivity from a union. Have you ever been in a bad relationship that was difficult to get out of? Everyone knew it was a bad relationship, including you, but you still found it difficult to break off. Think back. Was there sexual intimacy outside of marriage in that relationship? If so, what happened was that a sinful bond, or sundesmas, was formed as you repeatedly engaged in sex outside of marriage. What made that relationship so hard to end was the sinful bond that had been created. Now, listen carefully. Enslavement to sin is a matter of relationship. 
a relationship of master and slave, for it expresses both the master's power on the one side and the subjection and bondage experienced on the other. If you're addicted, you're in a bad relationship, one that's hard to break off due to the sinful union that was established over some period of time. So sin enslaves, but to make matters worse, not only does sin enslave, but sin controls. Romans 6.12 says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Lusts meaning desires. To let sin reign means to permit it to exist habitually in your life. This verse is saying, if you do that, uh, you will be controlled by a desire that's not even your own. It's the desire of sin, sin that lives within you. Now, this is a fairly complex subject that will be explained a little bit more in our next session. But for now, simply recognize that not only does sin enslave, but sin controls. So you see, sin enslaves you, controls you, takes you hostage, and makes you its prisoner. Any attempt to help someone find true and lasting freedom from addiction, I believe will likely fail unless primary attention is given to the enslaving and controlling effects of sin. In fact, attempts to make progress in other areas of life, such as relationships, work, emotional problems, uh, spiritual issues will almost never succeed unless and until the addictive behavior goes. The addiction will sabotage it every time. Well, now that we know what addiction is, a spiritual stronghold due to the effects of habitual sin, where do we go from here? Well, Jamie, we pointed out that it is essential to have a definition of addiction so we know what we're dealing with. Uh, now it becomes essential that we establish a goal. Uh, many will be surprised to learn that the goal is not to stop the addictive behavior. Walking by the Spirit does not consist in pouring all our energies into resisting sin. We'll be talking more about these concepts in upcoming sessions. The goal, however, for each student in this seminar is Christ-likeness. The reason that Christ-likeness is the goal is because that is God's overarching purpose for us. Romans 8.29 says, He predestined us to become conformed to the likeness of His Son, Christ-likeness. But here's the key principle. The more like Christ we are, the more power we have over temptation and sin. That's why Christ-likeness is the goal. Now just think about that for a moment. If you're more like Christ, you will of necessity have more power over temptation and sin. Notice that this is a positive emphasis, not a negative one. We're not asking people to perfect abstinence from sin. We're asking folks to simply grow into increasing Christ-likeness so that they will have more power over temptation and sin. This emphasis on active spiritual formation, rather than simply attempting to perfect restraint, is what makes the Breaking the Chain seminar different than most addiction ministries. That makes perfect sense to me. But if Christ-likeness is the goal, how do I do that? How many ways are there to be like Christ? Uh, good question, Jamie. There are actually only three ways to be like Christ, thought, word, and deed. The reason that there are only three ways to be like Christ is that all that you are is expressed in thought, word, and deed. There are simply no other ways for you to be you other than in thought, word, and deed. This is actually really good news because it means that the goal of growing into increasing Christ-likeness is not an overwhelming endeavor. 
It's a matter of having to focus on only three areas, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. That's great, Paul. Now, let's review. In this session, we have learned that addiction is a spiritual stronghold resulting from habitual sin. The nature of sin is that it enslaves and controls. The way to find true and lasting freedom from addiction is to grow into increasing Christ-likeness, and that there are only three ways to be like Christ, thought, word, and deed. Well, we spent quite a bit of time in this session talking about sin, Jamie, but the student should realize that there's good news here. Uh, the good news is that if sin is the problem, and it is, God has already made provision for that. In other words, there is a solution for the enslaving and controlling effects of sin that will result in true and lasting freedom. And that will be the subject of our next session. I look forward to that. Thank you for joining us today for session one, What is Addiction? We look forward to seeing you next time for session two, which is entitled Freedom from Addiction, possibly the most important session of the seminar. Until then, may God bless you and keep you and motivate you to work hard on all the assignments in the student workbook. In this section, we're going to take a few minutes to answer the most frequently asked questions that typically come up in live seminars. Questions you may be asking yourself after having watched session one. Paul, some of the viewers in this video have had experiences in other programs. What would you say to them as they encounter what may seem like a radical departure from principles they've learned from various recovery models? I'd say give this biblical approach a chance. If they're watching this, it may be because they simply want to learn and grow more but it is more likely that they have tried other ways to stop their addictive behavior and those other ways haven't worked. It has been said that uh, we Christians will not always behave in accordance with what we profess, but we will typically behave in accordance with what we believe. Most Christians believe that the Bible can be trusted as God's instruction book for living. That being the case, why not explore the Word of God to discover what I term the biblical provisions for addiction? The premise for this is that God hasn't overlooked addiction and that the biblical provisions for addiction are sufficient for finding true and lasting freedom in Christ. As we continue through this seminar, viewers will likely be grateful and relieved to discover the many applications for addiction found in the Bible. They will also likely discover that they have never thought of addiction in this kind of way before and that the biblical solution not only makes perfect sense, but resonates on a profound level with their souls. But addictions can have medical, psychological, and sociological characteristics. So why should we emphasize the sin component? Well, because since sin enslaves and controls, any attempt to deal with addiction on another level first is likely to fail. Now, some would advocate working on emotional issues first and that this might in fact resolve the addiction. I argue that the medical, psychological, and sociological characteristics associated with addictions are not typically causes, but are symptoms. The pathways to addiction are as multiple and complex as the individuals themselves. In fact, there does not need to be any cause for addiction other than a person simply makes the mistake of opening the door to a harmful habitual behavior. The Bible says that evil will not deliver those who practice it. Hence, unless the habitual sin is dealt with, nothing else will fall into place. Perhaps the biggest recovery model out there is AA's 12 steps, which are based upon the disease concept. There are many Christian ministries that base their models on the 12 steps, either using them exactly as written or modifying them somewhat, such as by making Jesus their higher power. Why aren't you advocating a similar approach? because no one has ever discovered the disease of addiction. Not only that, but no one has ever discovered the addictive gene and no one has ever discovered the addictive personality. As of today, these things simply do not exist, except in theory. Remember, the disease model is officially called the disease concept, not science, 
not fact, concept, meaning theory or idea. The disease concepts agent for change, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, has been shown in endless valid scientific studies to be ineffective with only a 10% success rate on average. A model built upon a false premise cannot succeed. But the biggest problem I have with the disease concept and the 12 steps is that they are antithetical to, to biblical principles. For example, why should any Christian say that they are powerless when the Bible says that they have been given a spirit of power and can do all things through Christ who strengthens them? Furthermore, why should any Christian call themselves an addict when the Bible says that they are new creations fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image, God's workmanship, and complete in Christ? God does not look upon one of his children who is addicted and say, this is my beloved son or daughter, the addict. For any Christian to call themselves an addict is to take on a false negative failure identity. We do not get our identities from what we do, even habitually. As one prominent Christian author has put it, it's not what we do that determines who we are. It's who we are that determines what we do. I sleep every night. I eat every day. I take frequent walks. I, I play or practice golf several times a week, hopefully. Uh, these are habitual behaviors. Should I say my name is Paul, I am a sleeper, an eater, a walker, a golfer? Of course not. That would be to take on an identity based upon what I do instead of who I am as a child of God. Everything about who we are emanates from our being children of God. That's our true identity. Think about this. What if I go to uh, certain meetings regularly and state my name is Paul, and I am an alcoholic. And I do this day after day, week after week, month after month. I am an alcoholic, I am an alcoholic. Well, what do alcoholics do? They drink heavily. If I believe I am an alcoholic, won't I behave like one? On the contrary, if I believe that I am a child of God and understand all that that means, how am I likely to behave? Well. There's an aspect of this, of this that could be considered an identity crisis. To me, it's no wonder that even Christians fail in 12-step programs when they are told that they are addicts with a disease over which they are powerless. I do want to say that I understand that all this may be unsettling for those who have come to believe in the disease concept in the 12 steps. Those who have trusted in this theory and in recovery model could be left feeling insecure and apprehensive since if that doesn't work, then what do you have? Suddenly the only hope you had just evaporated. It's been called into question. That could be scary. Uh, I want to reassure every student though that, that God is still in control and only wants what's best for them. In fact, he has a superior way for them that will leave them feeling more secure not simply by trying to abstain, but by giving them true and lasting freedom in Christ. Well, thanks for that explanation of your philosophy and why you have chosen an emphatically biblical approach. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you in session two. Session one was profound for me for a number of reasons. Initially, I was nervous about the seminar. I didn't know what the approach was going to be with the Breaking the Chain series, but I was quickly put at ease when I realized that it is based on God's Word, which gave me a relief and uh, a much different perspective than anything I had heard before. With that came a, an opportunity to explore a different definition of addiction from what the world sees as far as a disease concept to really understanding as a spiritual problem. That addiction is a spiritual stronghold and that is something that I can break free from. Once I understood that, I was able to really grasp the idea of the enslavement of sin. And one of the goals to me of my Christian walk is to be uh, a slave to righteousness as Paul writes in, in the New Testament, we are to be bond servants, bond slaves 
of, of righteousness. But you can't really understand, or I couldn't understand what that meant until I understood how fully I was enslaved to sin in, in my spiritual stronghold. Once I got a grasp of that, then I could see the spiritual solution that was being offered to me through God's Word and through this series. Um, once I was able to see that, then the idea of Christ-likeness really locked into place for me as far as being like Christ in thought, word, and deed. So it was a, pro a progression of not only understanding the definition of words, but understanding in my heart how that was all going to unfold for me in, throughout the series. But it was critical that I understood that Christ-likeness is the goal and being enslaved to sin is something that I no longer have to be.